Certainly. Uh, well, first, thank you all uh, for having me here today. I, um, gosh, I just can't wait for us to get through COVID like everybody else. I, um, it's been so long. I would, I wish I was on campus with, uh, with you presenting today, but I'm not. I'm happy to. Uh, I wish I had one of those bookcases, like you see those virtual bookcases, so I could show you my uh, Cal Poly Pomona professor for the day that I got. So um, <laughs> just now I'm the moderator for the day. So I'm glad to be able to do that. So good afternoon. Victor Simmons, uh, I am currently the Vice President of Human Resources and Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Atelier ACE. Um, relatively small uh, uh, operation of hotels. We've got about uh, 10 hotels across the country with one in Japan. And um, we have uh, some projects on in Canada and Australia that uh, we hope to still uh, be on pace right now for opening next year. And, um, you know, I started out, grow, I grew up in this business. I went to Cal Poly for, you know, for this. And I commuted actually from Palm Springs uh, up to the school while I was working in banquets uh, because I knew that this was gonna be my career. And I worked in operations in a number of positions my goal was to get in as many departments as I could before I graduated, and um, I made it through almost every uh, discipline. And then um, after a number of years uh, holding department head positions, uh, I found my way into human resources, and um, I was working for Marriott at that time. I had left La Quinta Resort and Club after, gosh, a dozen years, thinking I knew it all at this point, being in the business, you know, 12, 15 years in, thinking I knew everything. And I got to Marriott and I learned so much more about how to take care of our customers and how to take care of each other. And um, I was still in operations, but I, about three years into Marriott, I moved into human resources and it became so much more rewarding than I ever thought it was gonna be. And I also learned there, um, being a champion of DEI, uh, in previous roles before getting into HR uh, was what helped me gravitate into this field. And I'll tell you that Marriott back then, we're talking in the, in the uh, early 90s, uh, Marriott was already focusing in on DEI. And there were a number of things that they were doing in their programming, around associate engagement, in their performance management, in their incentives. Um, so uh, I started learning that there, and then I found my way into Starwood Hotels before uh, the merger and was with them for uh, uh, about six years, all in HR. And then um, I found my way coming out to the East Coast uh, with Wyndham Hotels and Resorts, still in uh, HR initially as the area director of HR. I oversaw eight uh, properties here on the Northeast. And then because of all of the work that I was doing in the space of DEI that uh, Wyndham hadn't seen at the property level, they were already doing it from a corporate perspective, but not really at the property level. And they saw some of the things that I was doing that I learned from Marriott, and it afforded me the opportunity to go in as the director of diversity and inclusion for Wyndham Hotels and Resorts. And I've been doing that for the last couple of years. And then COVID hit and my job was eliminated. And um, in around March, there were two buckets. And I think this is important for this conversation. In March, there were two buckets. There was the bucket of, well, now more than ever, because of what we have seen, what's going on with the Asian community, what we're seeing with people of color being impacted by COVID, now more than ever, DEI is, is first and foremost. And then there was the other bucket that I happened to fall in, uh, where it was not considered essential at that time. Now they still left behind, they took out a couple of folks along with 300 plus other corporate individuals. They did leave some people behind to do some of the DEI work there, but nonetheless, my role was, was eliminated in that bucket. And then as you saw what was going on in the world, right? There was this uprising of social outcry of uh, the, the injustices and quite frankly, the murders that were going on of people of color and you saw now there was a third bucket there was oh my gosh we don't have anything and we need to get some stuff together and there was another bucket of quite frankly 
those that were being performative and just posting positions, not really filling them. Uh, because I was out there looking at these roles and talking to people, and I was in a number of communities uh, that are in this space. I continue to stay active. And then there was the bucket of those that were truly uh, doing work already, uh, discovered that there were some, some missteps that had happened, some blind spots, and they were truly trying to get uh, the traction back in that world and, and get things back under control. And um, ACE was one of them. And uh, if we have time, I'll tell you about a little bit more about that. But uh, here I am today, and again, happy to be here. And I am gonna go ahead and just, um, I, I made some notes here. So I'm gonna go in this particular order and we'll kind of go up and down this list as we start asking questions. So I'm gonna turn, toss it to Amanda to tell us your story. Hi everybody, nice to be here with you guys all today. Um, I'm the founder and owner Founder and CEO of Innovate Marketing Group, we're an event and experiential agency, actually based in Pasadena, so not too far from Pomona. Actually, my own sister and brother-in-law also went to Cal Poly Pomona. So I know, very familiar with your program, very jealous of that wine class that you guys have that I heard you get credit for. I was disappointed my college didn't have something like that. But my career really started in, you know, in terms of hospitality and events once I graduated college, I started actually in operations. And I actually had the opportunity to work at Weston for a little bit as well before I went on to full-time work at, you know, a corporation. And then essentially three years after that, I started my first events agency back in 2006. And then 2014, I started another one, which is the company that I have now, Innovate Marketing Group. And some of our clients, you probably heard of them, range anywhere from TikTok to City National Bank to Honda. And during this time, because of COVID, you know, you really have to pivot, right? So normally we do live events and during this time, we're doing all virtual. And as we speak, my team is actually doing a virtual conference. So uh, hopefully you can't hear them in the background, but we have a big conference that's happening today. And I'm excited to be here and share more insights and about my journey. Yeah. And then also I sit on various boards. I currently sit on entrepreneur organization as the DNI chair. So I think my passion does come, you know, in terms of all the diversity and inclusion initiative, being Asian myself and being a woman myself, you know, a lot of time company, you know, I check both of those boxes, right? Um, I sat on various boards and for even our own agency, if you check out our website, we already incorporate a lot of that even prior to the incident. I think there's a lot of people that's trying to do that right now, which is fantastic, but that's always been top of mind at our agency and I'm looking forward to share even more later on. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Lerma, but just before we do that, uh, Amanda, tell me which Weston were you at? Weston Bonaventure in downtown Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, okay. Yes. And I, I know, I just saw somebody else on there, good, good, good friend of mine who uh, was at that property as well. So uh, we'll have to connect afterwards. <laughs> All right, Lerma. Oh, hello everyone. I am very pleased to meet you all. And I'm very excited to be part of this panel discussion for today. Uh, first, I would like to thank Anne for inviting me to join this panel. So allow me to introduce myself. Um, I'm Lerma Harwood and I'm originally from the Philippines. I was born in Manila and I came from a big family of seven children. Now the Philippines, as you may know, it's a densely populated country and therefore very competitive. So part of our culture and in order to survive in a very competitive environment, most parents struggle to send their kids to colleges to have a degree and be part of a professional workforce. So I was fortunate that my parents were able to send me to private schools and I completed my business degree in one of the big universities in Manila. So my initial experience working in the hospitality industry was at the Hyatt Regency, followed by a brief stint at the Mandarin Oriental Manila, working in sales and marketing. So while in sales position, I met my American clients who were just setting up a branch office in the Philippines at the time. I was offered a great position with a salary that I could not resist. And I said goodbye to my hospitality sales career and joined a major US engineering consulting firm. So now 
being in an engineering consulting firm, you can easily guess that was a male dominated environment. So I was one of only two females in the executive management level and was in charge of human resources, operations and finance. And in, in addition, I took part in business development and public relations. That was such a great experience for me. Now, in early 2003, I relocated to Los Angeles, where I lived for 17 years. And while in LA, I pursued my career further in human resources. So as you may know, I'm sure, Victor, um, you, you will agree with this. Human resources is a culture-based profession. And one has to learn the laws, culture, and practices in this country to be able to function effectively in that role. Yeah. So I strive hard and I studied human resources management first in, with UCLA Extension, then with Ecornell under the International Labor Relations School, where I completed my advanced certificate in strategic human resources management. So I worked with the Peninsula Beverly Hills for 14 years, held the position of human resources manager for eight years, and afterwards I moved to learning and development. So as an L&D manager, I took charge of training, mentoring, and developing our employees, of course, among other functions. And as you know, the Peninsula Hotels is a very prestigious brand in the hospitality industry, and it is recognized to, um, for its high-end luxury hotel service, high-profile clientele. So I had such great experience working for this company, and I was fortunate to be part of a successful team in a leadership role for many years. And the Peninsula Hotels have a very diversified group of employees. Corporate office, which is located in Hong Kong, is big in promoting um, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. This is part of the Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability Program. So fast forward to 2020, okay? Um, early this year, due to a great job offer from the Standard Highline Hotel, which is the flagship hotel for all the standard hotels here, um, I decided to leave LA and move to New York City. That was in early February. Where um, New York City, because my mom and my sisters live there, so I thought it was a great opportunity for me to live in the same city as my family, so I accepted the job offer. I left the peninsula and I worked with the different hotel brand. Um, I chose to do that due to my desire to have an exposure and gain experience in an entirely different city and work environment. And of course, the standard high line also has a very diversified group of employees. So um, that's my story. And um, well, like everyone else has a COVID story. From there, you know, when I got there, after being there for just more than a month, of course, New York City has to close down, lock down. So I was living in the hotel at that time. And before I got settled into an apartment, the whole city locked down. So there's no place for me to go. So then uh, we escaped New York during that time in the epicenter that's, that was in March. And we did a cross country travel to the West. We went to Chicago first and then Indianapolis. And then I ended up here in Reno where, you know, this is my father-in-law's place. And we're just lucky to have a place here and you know, keep him company. So that's my story. And um, brings me to why I, I have been invited to join this panel. Well, I have this exposure to big multicultural cities and working in a diverse um, employee population. So there's also that diversity in my background. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Irma. You know, between the two of us with hospitality, booze, and rooms, you know, you and I could write a book on the things that go on from the world of HR. So but oh, we, won't, yes. we, won't, we won't digress today. Uh, so going on to Jeff. Jeff, tell us your story. Howdy, everyone. Um, first and foremost, before I get started on my history, I just want to tell all the younger gentlemen that are on this call, take a look at my head, take a look at Victor's head, take a look at Michael Godfrey's head. This is your future in hospitality. So I just want to be absolutely clear for that. So <clears throat> my background, I was born and raised in Napa County. Um, started my career at 15 and a half when I got my permit as a busboy and never looked back. I've been in hospitality ever since. When I got that job as a busboy, 
I, I thought I was living the dream. I was walking home with wads of cash, which was probably about $22 in ones. And I thought this, this was it for me. I needed nothing more in my life. So I wanted to continue with hospitality. I got the uh, Cal State booklet in the mail because there was no internet then and saw this school, Cal Poly Pomona, that had a hospitality program. So I applied there, uh, went down there, had an amazing experience at Cal Poly um, and out of school got hired by Four Seasons. And at the time, it was big time. I moved to San Francisco and I was making $21,000. And I thought, once again, after those wads of $1 bills as a busboy, I thought, this is it. This is going to be the best thing ever. After Four Seasons, which was the perfect base for me to get into the hospitality business because of the level of service and the level of expectations, it really laid a solid foundation for where I am today. I, got, um, I worked at restaurants. I worked at um, other hotels. I moved to Philly for a while, which was a huge mistake. I'm back in California very happily. Went back to uh, San Francisco. And then fortunate for myself, moved to Yauntville 17 years ago. And for you, those of you who are familiar, we have a French Laundry in Yauntville, as well as Thomas Keller's Bouchon. Um, his fiefdom is overseen by him because he chose to shelter in place in Yonville, of course, and not New York. <clears throat> in this time, uh, I met another alum. So I graduated in uh, 1989. I'm sure most of you children on this call weren't even born yet, which fucking kills me. Sorry. Um, but also, uh, I met when I moved back to California, uh, Joe Wallows, who was actually graduated in what year? Technically 93. 93, and let's be clear, we're the same age. He was on a much different schedule than I was. I graduated in four years. Um, met him, and he convinced me to get into the hotel real estate business because at that time I was working 90 hours a week in the restaurant business. Got my real estate license, worked as a waiter at night and a hotel real estate person during the day so I could get back on my feet. And we then went out on our own and started the Passport Group, which is our hotel real estate company. And we currently have one other agent uh, working for us, and we work um, everywhere west of the Mississippi just doing transactions for hotels. Uh, 13 and a half years ago, we got a listing up in Humboldt County, which until 2016, when cannabis was legalized, uh, over 90% of the cannabis in the whole US came from came from Humboldt County. It's now in the 60 percentile. So we bought a Holiday Inn Express. And I've got to admit, uh, when I bought that Holiday Inn Express, the Ace Hotel of Palm Springs has always been my go-to poster child for what I want my hotel to be. And slowly but surely, we're getting there. Uh, seven years ago, we made the decision to take it independent. And it was the best uh, decision we could have ever made. So now I have a team of 19 employees, three and a half hours, four hours away from my home, and they're an amazing group. I'm very, very fortunate with what we've put together up there. <clears throat> we also, in 95, the winery, thank God he's here. 2000, 2005. 2005, sorry, started our own wine project. So we have Gentleman Farmer Wines, uh, started out, thank you, started out, Go to gentlemanfarmerwines.com. It's also at the restaurant when it gets back open at Cal Poly. Um, started Gentleman Farmer Wines, and now because of my husband's work, we're up to about a thousand cases we produce a year. Um, we're on the wine list at uh, French Laundry, as well as a bunch of other amazing places. And we also were fortunate enough to purchase a building downtown Napa at the beginning of this year, and we'll be opening our own individual tasting room in 2021. So. I read a great quote and I got to go off screen real quick and tell you, it says, this is a time that is making us better if we use it in that way. And it's really struck to me because Joe and I have really laid the foundation for 
<clears throat> what's important for us at our hotel in Humboldt County. We have uh, Latinx employees. We have employees who just finished high school. We have employees who served in the Army who are now working for us. And we've really tried to focus on the employees. Everything else will come if we can take care of them. And what's been so exciting for me is to see this panel that I, when Anna sent it out to me, I was excited to be on this call because of the opportunities I can learn from the other panel to panelists. Being in this corporate world, being on this high level, overseeing all these employees, I got a great opportunity to learn. We're trying our best. I'm doing it on my own with my GM and everything that we read and everything that we do every day. But we really see that in 2020, it's our opportunity to step forward and get head and shoulders above all of our comp set and our competition in Humboldt County and really make the difference through our team and through the diversity of people that we've had. And it's starting to pay off. We um, were fortunate enough to reopen June 12th. We have been at a 91% occupancy or higher since June 12th. Um, we and the team, I'm once again, I'm four hours away. The team has done an amazing job. And with my hotel steward, Alicia, she has set the tone for the quality of the employees we have, um, hiring for attitude and not competency because we can always train someone how to make a bed has really paid off and to be able to bring together the diverse people that we have had at this hotel to lead us to where we are today probably one of the worst times for many of us um, and to see the comments to see the response from our guests has been absolutely amazing so i'm really excited to be on this panel again today to learn even more from these panelists about how we can continue that and continue that diversity. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. I have so many questions for you, but we'll obviously have to take that um, as time continues to slip away. Gosh, an hour is just not enough. Uh, so uh, Ari, tell us uh, a bit about yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for being here and, and inviting me as well. So I graduated from Cal Poly in 2018. Uh, originally from the West Coast, but I actually started my college on the East Coast in Vermont. Um, back then, I graduated high school 2007, so I had a long career in education. I wanted to do forensic accounting. Realized that wasn't for me a semester and a half from graduating. Stayed in school, fell in love with hospitality, and that was my pursuit. Originally, if you would have told me, I thought I'd be a general manager of a Disney hotel. And now I'm in HR, so very similar as well to you, where you're kind of moving around and pivoting and adjusting here. Right now, I work for the Walt Disney Company in talent acquisition and diversity, inclusion, and equity, specifically with veteran initiatives. I'm part of Salute, one of our business employee resource groups. I also sit on a steering committee, so I drive our executive worldwide initiatives for veteran talent, as well as other things that we can engage in the community. And then also, I'm an ally for all our other business employee resource groups. In April of 2020, I was furloughed from the Walt Disney Company at the time due to we're just not hiring. Um, as you know, Disney World now is out open, Disneyland, uh, maybe the hotels are coming up soon, nothing's been fully announced yet. However, as you may see today, I'm in uniform. I currently also serve in the United States Navy as a reservist. I am the command career counselor for my unit and also an engineer. So aloha, I'm in Hawaii for a year here doing some work there in COVID relief. Um, but I'm also able to wear that diversity, inclusion, equity hat here as well in driving the military um, movement going forward as uh, many times companies are behind the military is much further behind with a lot of their thinking. So it's great to be a part of their driving force as well. Uh, I'm going short on the intro here as I know we almost are 25 minutes through and I know we have a lot to talk today. Um, I know Ann put my LinkedIn information so please connect as I'm a recent grad but been able to network and grow, especially in diversity, inclusion, equity space. I sit on four different board of directors within this space, including a VP of a group that was founded during COVID called Diversity and Inclusion Futures. And we're all about the future of diversity, inclusion, equity, creating a free platform on LinkedIn, sharing ideas, best practices, and bringing awareness to monthly celebrations, things that's going on, but as well as current events. Awesome, Ari. Thank you for shortening that so we could get to the questions. And I'm going to take advantage since I'm the moderator. I saw that you linked up with me on LinkedIn last night. Thank you for that. 
I want to speak to you specifically uh, off sidebar about, um, I worked with, ours was Salutes with Wyndham. Uh, we do not have uh, ERGs yet. We're too young of a company to start those up. We have a diversity council at ACE, but I did want to talk to you specifically about veterans in the LGBTQ community, uh, because yes. we, as you, as you look at our brand, you see that we lean into that uh, community. So I want to talk to you about that. So if you don't mind hitting me up after this so that we can, we can chat about that, I appreciate it. So Absolutely let's love get, to. Thank you. So let's get into the questions. The first question right out the gate, I was going to sort of go in a particular order, but I'm going to toss it out there. I think you've got these ahead of time, so I'm sure you've thought about this. So whoever's ready to go with the first question, I'm just going to go ahead and you can just uh, shout out and say, yeah, I'll take it. And then that's the way we'll roll through this so we can get through a little bit quicker. Um, and we'll take maybe one or two, we'll take two, and then we'll just go to the next question as opposed to asking each panelist. We all good with that? Awesome. All right. So first question, do you feel that your unique attributes, traits, uh, your characteristics, skills, your experience and background um, are valued at work. So who, who feels that they uh, want to take that one first? Go ahead, Ari, I see your hand. Yes, um, so I'll say now yes before no. Uh, and I've been with Disney for eight years um, and I see a few of you smiling here and probably relating to that. I'm fortunate to have the right leadership to support and see me as an individual for who I am being a service member, being someone who is passionate about diversity, inclusion, equity, and my passions and letting me run with it. Uh, and the skills and traits I gained along the way, taking the feedback and network and growing and being able to mesh the two. And that's the beauty of Disney, but it wasn't always that way at Disney. There are times where, yes, I was in the military and I had these other things going for me, but oh, you're just that and your focus may not be there. And they look at you as an individual and a number instead of who you truly authentic are. A lot at Disney we talk about is how do you bring your authentic self to work and how do you let that shine, right? How do I let Ari be Ari at work? How do I let, you know, Sally be Sally at work and so forth? And how do you let them bring their personality and themselves out? So the biggest thing is having the right leadership there. Don't always work for the brand name like Disney as much as we would love you to be there, but find the right leadership within the area of a company that you know stands for what you believe in and can then let you shine and go forward. Awesome, very good. Anybody else wanna uh, take that one on? Lerma, I think you wanna do it, but you're on your mute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, just to add to, uh, you know, to that question, you know, Filipinos, we are known to be warm and hospitable people and also very industrious and hardworking. So these are traits that are appreciated in a work environment, especially in the hospitality industry. So um, they appreciate me for these inherent traits that, traits that I have. Um, and in addition to that, since I've worked my way up and got into my position right now, um, Director of People Development, where I train uh, employees and support them in their development. So um, I get appreciation from managers and department heads. They value me, of course, when um, they come to me and thank me um, when I help train their employees and they're able to reach their department goals. So now I would say best appreciation that I get in my role is when an employee comes to me to personally thank me after they land a promotion and they would attribute that to achievements you know, uh, that they have um, taken away from the trainings or coaching sessions that I do for them. So then I feel that I have a certain influence in the business. Great, great. And then did I, well, Jeff, did I see you trying to j jump in? Was there, no? Okay. Anybody I'm else? The I'm the boss and the boss loves me. So everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Same with me. No, no, but I just want to put it, you know, in terms of another perspective, right? So cool. when I used to work cool. for another company, I definitely look for a company that valued the DNI. And sometimes not obvious, but you need to ask that question, right? So for all you, young folks, professionals out there, ask those questions. You know, a lot of time when you go into these interviews, they, the interviewer always asks, do you have any question? Never say, I don't have question. Always have prepared question, and this could be one of your questions, right? And I would say at our agency, and over the years, I hire a lot of people because I've been in the business for 15 plus years. I also look for diversity too, 
right? So we're equal opportunity employer, but you know what? When I have diversity on my team, my team is healthier, happier, and it's just more fun too, you know? And I say, I would say when I first, I actually was originally from Taiwan and we moved here when I was 10. And I remember going to class and I was the one out of the two Asians in my class, you know, and it felt really lonely, right? And I think back then I tried to blend in more, try to be more American. And as time evolves, I realized, you know what? I am Chinese American. I can be both, you know, because it's actually really fun because all the other people was like, tell me more about your culture, you know? So don't be shy, share who you are. Kind of like what Ari said, be who you are, do it in a professional way. And I think you, you'll be pleasantly surprised of what you get back. You know, uh, and I think that's a great ending to that question. The, all, the only other thing I want, would like to add to that um, is for you that uh, that's out there, if there are business owners on the line, and then those of you that are future leaders or current leaders, think about this from an inclusive leadership standpoint. You want to be an inclusive leader. And when you do that, you want to make sure that you are seeing your individuals that are working for you. You want to see who they are and you want them to be able to bring their whole selves uh, to work. And when you are showing value in that, you know, when there is, when we, when we get information from multiple perspectives, you just heard, you know, four different perspectives there. And when you take all of that to help you uh, lead your team, you're, you're usually going to find more creative creativity, more innovation uh, through that. So thank you uh, panelists for that. Okay. Uh, on to the next question. In regards to identity, so now we're going to drill down a little bit more here. In regards to identity, do you remember a specific experience uh, of where you were, um, where you wish that you had done something differently? And if you were to do it over, what would you change? Go ahead, Jeff. So I'm 53 years old. <clears throat> I'm obviously married to Joey, so I'm gay. Um, but I didn't come out till I was 25. And I still, to this day, um, think about that all the time. And this speaks to just your true self and your authenticity, as the panelists were talking before on the last uh, question. Um, it took me a long time to be true and authentic to myself, but it also, I realized it was learning more about myself as an individual, as a hospitality person, as a business owner, um, as a real estate broker, and as a gay man. The gay man thing doesn't just define who I am, but it's definitely part of who I am. And I think that's important for everybody listening today that you bring something to every opportunity and you need to own it. And believe me, um, I use my hotel as an example. We're in Humboldt County. It, it's a totally different. It, it's a totally different world up there. Humboldt County is the size of the state of Maine, um, and the people that we get walking through the doors um, for work um, are an interesting mix of people. But the people mm -hmm. who walk in, own their experience, own who they are, are the people that stand out that we want to have as a part of our team. Um, and it makes a huge difference. So looking back, I just wish I would have owned myself earlier and not let others tell me who I was, especially at that time, especially my family, um, who have all since come around. Um, but uh, I think it's very important to own it from the very beginning on every level. Very good. Anybody else? I may add to that. Oh, sorry. Um, so I just, just want to add uh, to that, Jeff, and great points is as a white heterosexual male, I can't relate to you, but I can where I had a gay uncle, right? And for me, it was always accepting. So I was able to, as a young adult, relate to everyone, right? And understand and see that. And for those that are Caucasian like myself and heterosexual, remember that there are those who aren't as privileged and have those abilities and pick them up with you and take them along the way and show them the light to be their authentic self. Uh, I view that as unfortunately in the world we live in today, it's not that for a lot of my peers and a lot of my close friends. So with the current Black Lives Matter, the racial injustice going on, Check, check in on everyone, make sure they're doing okay. Um, because more often than not, they're not gonna be as vocal about it. And we wanna make sure that we are able to be there 
for our friends and see them for who they truly are. Listen to Ari, man. Ari is, he's not just a recruiter. He is, he's a future DEI practitioner right there. Uh, uh, Lerma, you were trying to say something as well. Yes, I just want to share uh, my story, which I know that, you know, there was uh, listening out there would be able to, you know, to um, learn from this. So uh, coming from where I came from in the Philippines, I remember a situation where I was questioned about my professional qualifications and I felt belittled. So in a previous company that I worked, I applied for a higher position and went through the process of interview and selection. And then afterwards, I was offered the position. When I was called to discuss the position and the salary, I was informed that it will not be a promotion for me, but instead just a lateral transfer with the same salary. Now, at that time, I felt that that was not a fair decision since my predecessor was actually given a higher pay. So I questioned and I defended my position and then mentioned that I had the same number of years of management experience, including eight years when I was in the company in the Philippines. Now, to my surprise, the response that I got was, um, but that was just in the Philippines, right? That was in the Philippines. So I felt so intimidated and saw that whatever I say, they will not give me the promotion. So I shut up and I just accepted it. Now, do I wish that um, I have done something differently? I would say yes. I should have spoke up and defended my previous experience. Um, it should have been counted. And of course, I understand that uh, there are companies there that they value certain qualifications, but the way it was said to me was just not right. It wasn't right. It was an awful experience for me. And my advice to those who may encounter the same situation, please speak up and be heard. Uh, probably if I did, the impression that I left might have been better. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. You know, we find that um, many people in that we find in underrepresented groups are uh, find themselves in situations like this often and don't feel like uh, for a number of reasons that they're able to step up and speak up and say, hey, wait, hold on a second, because there is this um, concern. If you do say something, you're already uh, underrepresented. And then if you say something, you're more apt to end up being further uh, pushed out. So um, the tide is turning and there is certainly much more focus on equity and um, your, there are classes out there that show you how to be able to get yourself uh, together in terms of the facts and what you need in order to be able to present a good business case. And I would encourage you to do that in order to do that. The other thing I would uh, quickly say is coming out day, National Coming Out Day is coming up next month, October 11th. That is one of the hardest things to do. Uh, my son did not have the opportunity to come out. He was dragged out by uh, his, my ex-wife. Um, you know, she confronted him. Are you gay? Are you gay? And, um, you know, that's a moment for him. And that's a, that's a time for him to be able to come out, not be dragged out. And I would say that what you want to think about again, from an inclusive leadership standpoint, is there are, I'm sure there's, we, we got 46 people on here. There's some people that still don't understand the LGBTQ community. There are people on here right now out of 46. I'm confident of that. What I would say to those people is that if, do you have anybody in your, in your circle that you have engaged with and asked questions? And if you haven't, you need to do that because when you do those things, not just with the LGBTQ community, but any community that you don't understand, and you start adding that into your circle of friends, just like we are doing in corporate, right? We are starting to make sure that we, our workforce matches our customers. You should make sure that your friendships match the, the world, right? So when you do that- I wonder if he's actually sick. Start to come down, uh, so much more. So. Um, I just leave that with you. All right. So uh, let's go on to the next question, which is to what extent do you feel that you can disclose your whole identity to your colleagues? Very good question here. Are there aspects of your social identity that you feel you need to keep separate from the workplace? So who would like to tackle that? I'm going to say something. 
First of all, I want to say, Ari, thanks for qualifying that you're a heterosexual male. When you asked me to be friends on LinkedIn yesterday, I saw your photo with that outfit, so it was questioning. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I'm on the Yonfield Town Council here. Um, I've been on the council for six years, and I'm running, I don't know why I made this decision in this current political climate. I'm running for re-election right now. Um, it's interesting. Two years ago, I proposed that we raise the gay flag in Yonville. Um, I'd lived here 15 years. I'd been on the council four years at that time, and it was the right thing to do. Um, I, I, there was some strong groups in Napa that I wanted to show support for. There was also one of the employees at the town who headed up one of the departments. Her 11-year-old son had just come out to her. And I can't even get my head around that because at 11, I, I, it's just amazing to me um, in this day and age that that's happening. And I think it's great. So at the time, I thought it was really important to do this. And everybody knew Joey. Everybody knew me. I was a huge participant in this town. There's only 3,100 people in this town. So um, I proposed it, and it was am amazing the backlash that came back and some of the letters that were sent. Um, and once again, in this day and age, two, two years ago, I thought, I can get married now. Everybody loves me. Everybody thinks I'm fine. Nobody's worried about me. Um, and the backlash was really interesting um, to see. And... <clears throat> It passed unanimously. And what ended up happening was all of a sudden it passed. So the town sent out an email and said, hey, we're going to raise the gay flag in front of the town tomorrow. You know, if anybody wants to show up and they posted it on social media and everything. Over 60 people from the town showed up. I mean, and this was such a diverse group. And it was amazing to see that. And the point of all this is that this whole time I was thinking about that 11 year old boy who would be dropped off at his mom's work, walk past town, town hall with that gay flag and then go to school and what that meant to him. And I think we all have an opportunity um, to make sure that those, and Ari spoke to it earlier, that those checking in on those people to show them that they have support, whether they're gay, whether they're black, whether it's Latinx, um, any of that community. We need people in our positions here, especially with all of you in HR, to know that these people have the support to be themselves, to be who they are moving forward. And it's our job um, for all of us on this panel to make sure that they have that support and that they know we're there for them. So that's my story. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, I saw you come off mute. Go ahead. Thank you. I was just going to say there, you know, a lot of incident because being Asian and woman, like we went actually into a huge pitch where literally we were probably the youngest and the only woman and diverse vendor that was in there. You know, everybody else was not diverse like we are. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, are we going to get this project? But for I, my lesson learned is that one, to speak up, don't be shy. And I would, that was one of my lessons. I wish I spoke up more when I was younger. Two, leverage the fact that you're different. You know, and I learned to do that over the years because guess what? People find me very interesting and very fascinating because I'm not like everybody else in the room. Right, so I always make sure, not today, I usually dress, like I have a pink suit. Um, I love standing out. I have a, you know, our company, our agency color is orange. So I love standing out because that's a spark of conversation. And the reason why I step up to, you know, be part of the diversity inclusion chair is because I have this opportunity to help the network, right? Because this specific organization was very male dominant. It's, when I look at the stats, it was a woman and diversity, right? And I find that very daunting. But at the same time, like there's a huge opportunity here for us to engage a member, right? Even the events we do, all, the panel, we always make sure to let the client know like, hey, you want, we should throw in some diversity in there. So it's not all just maybe one sex or one kind of nationality, you know, change it up because that's what the world is, is right now, especially in California, right? We're a melting pot here, so.
those are just different experiences. Yeah. Good. So we went, um, we were supposed to stop at 1240 for Q&A, which I'll, I'll turn it back over uh, to Ann to do that. Uh, let me just close this part out by saying when we're talking about, you know, identities, whether you're bringing them to work or not, think about um, there is this uh, concept of the iceberg. In the iceberg, you, you know, you see this large portion, but there's an even larger portion below the waterline. And the portion that you see is uh, race, gender, those type of things is what you do see. But there are many other things, disabilities sometimes, our thoughts, our perspectives that are below, uh, below the line. And, and still some of those things that we might even be above the line that we suppress below the line because we don't feel like it's a safe place in our, in our social circles, in our school settings, uh, and, our, and certainly in the workplace. And so this is the concept of unconscious bias. We certainly don't have time to go through that today, but think about those, those things. And then the last thing, again, um, just hearing Jeff's story and about the 11 year old walking across the way, I just wanted to push that point I made earlier a little uh, home a little bit more. When you look at our, when you look at our uh, homeless uh, community right now, when you look at the homeless, about 40% of that group are, the, are our youth, is society's youth. And in that 40% in that, that of that youth is the LGBTQ community because they, they came out and then were put out by their family and friends. And so I just, again, want to just bring that, something like that to your attention about how we do what Ari said, which I think is the message for today, check in with individuals and again, make sure that we are leading, we are inclusive leaders in whatever roles we are. You as a supervisor, you as a manager, you are, you are working with uh, the workforce, you know, you're, you're hand in hand with the workforce. And those actions, when you don't, when you have those blinders on, you are defeating the purpose of having your team be all that they can be, which will help you win the day. So with that, uh, I think we're going into Q&A. So I haven't looked in the chat. Am I doing the Q&A or is somebody coming on to help us do that? I, I will do that. And oh my gosh, Victor, you are an amazing moderator. Thank you so much um, for, for keeping us on track and, and going along. Uh, Dr. Fogel uh, has asked a question. Uh, she says, considering the social injustice challenges that are present today, do you think that diversity and inclusion in the workplace is doing enough? What things can students do to help better and grow openness and mindfulness of, within the workplace, but also society? Jeff. Let me, let me say something real quick, because uh, the rest of the panelists on with national companies uh, can definitely speak to this. But I got to say something. I, and it comes back to politics, again, in my small town. Um, but I, I went to, I tried, I was wanting to get endorsed by the Napa County Latinx Democrat Club. And I was on that call for two and a half hours because they did the entire Napa County. And all I could see was how hopeful I was for the future. It was all Latinx people on the call, um, all ranges, but the age of the young people who are getting involved is what's going to make the difference moving forward. It's, it's our future. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, this Latinx group and these young people, I am so inspired. I'll tell you this, when I walk around my town talking to the 65 year old white people, I'm concerned for our future. And I'll be honest with it. And I've let them know that the future is with every one of you on this call, because as a 53 year old guy kind of who feels 40, who's kind of teetering both ways. It's amazing what opportunities these kids and are bringing to people like me who are willing to listen, willing to learn, and want to be educated about it. So thank you. Uh, I'll jump in real quick and answer that from the corporate perspective. Anybody else certainly can jump in after me, but uh, is, it, you know, is corporate doing enough? No, <laughs> uh, we're not. Um, we got a lot. It, it is a marathon. Um, we have to move the needle beyond just putting out platitudes and saying, um, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter. We have to go in. We have to put a strategy together. We have to look at who's in the building, who's not in the building. We have to look at policies and practices that are in place that are pushing people out 
uh, and not pushing people up. We have to look at policies and practices that are not there and which ones need to be there in order to uh, accommodate that sponsorships, mentoring, and that type of thing. What can students do? Uh, as I said earlier, you, you know, look at your group of, look at your class that your study groups that you go and do study groups with, look at the groups that you're hanging out with and is it a diverse group? If it is, great. If it's not, you know, fill out your uh, portfolio of who you interact with. I'll go. Um, so in terms of what we see, uh, I would say a handful of companies are doing really well. And then the ones that are doing well is because they have buy-in from the top. Yeah. Right. So we do a lot of these events. We see a lot of the engagement and sponsorship that come through. The ones that are very active that does D, D and I really well. Again, it's from the top, and you hear it. We hear it at the board meeting. We hear it at the you know all their meetings. And then there are some that are just trying to do it. But you know, for the student, I would encourage you guys build that conversation. Right. Let your voices be heard, and that's what we're doing. We're hosting a lot of these diversity events because we want that voice to be heard. And I would say, Bill, you know, if there's an opportunity to have an organization, you know, there's, there's strength in number and unity, right? Because if scatter voices, it doesn't really get anywhere, but I think that's a starting point. But unify that voice, I think you guys will come up with something even stronger too. Yeah, great, that's great. Just yes. that, that, you know, um, leading from the having your significant leader. I work directly with the president. That makes all the difference in the world. Do we have any other questions? We do. We have quite a few questions. So um, we're going to run from Corey and says, I'd like to uh, hear the panelists' thoughts on the upcoming ballot vote on Prop 16 and its, its effect on the diversity and inclusion space. So Prop 16 would remove the ban on affirmative action involving race and sex based preferences. I can speak to that. Uh, and real quick, Jeff, by the way, that was my wedding photo. Uh, I wear bow ties pretty often. So bow tie Wednesday is something I do at work. Um, but um, I think, I don't think affirmative action should be there and it's not needed. Um, you look across in different areas, right? Um, and how can you hire inclusivity, right? From a talent acquisition standpoint. And something huge that we talked about is getting justice and justice is removing the barrier. And affirmative acts is just another way to climb over the wall. So if you just remove the barrier, you then create justice for all and don't have that issue anymore. Um, and you look at it as well, for example, I'm big into sports. So the NFL, they have the Rooney law or rule where you have to interview someone of color just because. Well, and a lot of teams go around it. It creates this extra work where you should hire the best, employ the best, get the best students for what they are and how they look. There's a lot of things called blind casting that goes on as well in various things where, you know, some people cut off the header. They never look at the name of anyone or where they're from and hire strictly on those, uh, their KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So there's many ways to work around it. And just the main point is, is it creates justice if you remove that barrier of that affirmative action. Uh, is, pro is that prop only for schools? You know, I have to be honest, I, I was I not familiar that, with it. Um, I I, it. It's it, because it was removed several years ago. I'll let's say one quick thing. There's nothing worse than the initiative process in California. When you can remove it, now we can put it back. So that's my stump. But yeah, it's just for school. Okay. Um, perfect. All right, so let's go for another question. I'm from Misty. She says, for people who don't have much experience in the workforce, but have a lot of experience in volunteering, how do you suggest to help grow yourself in your in your courage for helping be be new into a larger field? If you're if you are only doing volunteer work, which is which is great work, make sure that you take on leadership roles within that volunteer work because you you're, you're able to leverage that in your interviews in terms of the uh, leadership work you are doing. So make sure that you are doing that as would be one suggestion I have. And then just to add to that, kind of putting my talent acquisition hat on, that's what we look for a lot of times of diversity and inclusion, right? How do, what stands you apart? You're going to be like everyone else with their knowledge, skills, and abilities, but that volunteer work can really set you apart. It shows you're involved in the community, involved with a certain organization. And more often than not, 
especially from Big Disney, we're involved with those as well. So it's another great networking conversation piece and another way to round out a skill that you may not get from your current employment, but you can get from elsewhere that would be needed for that next job you're looking for. And I would just like to add to that, you know, look for internships, right? So I did that. I started volunteering and an internship. That's a great way to get insight into not only a company, because, you know, is that the company you want to be with? Or just also the job responsibility. Do I really want to be in hospitality or do I want to do something else? Right. So do internship. Even when our my own company, when I hire people, guess what? I look for not only volunteering, leadership, kind of like what Victor's saying, and internship experience. So if you don't have that, I actually don't even consider you. I agree with Amanda and Victor. If you're doing a lot of volunteer activities, then it shows your initiative. It's the kind of employee who I would hire. It shows leadership, it shows involvement, it shows engagement. So go for it. Wonderful. Um, a question from, from Brandon. Um, how, do you, how do you manage working with so many different diverse groups? What are some skills um, that, you, that you utilize when working with many groups? So at, at Disney, we have multiple, uh, we call them business employee resource groups, other call them ERGs. I, I love collaborating with them. Um, something I learned early on was you surround yourself with five smart people, you just became the sixth smartest person in the room. When I surround myself with more diverse people, learning their stories, seeing what they can bring to the table, we work together, especially being a veteran and currently serving, we touch every business employee resource group. We have women, we have disabilities, we have Latina, we have the LGBTQ+, we have STEM and so forth and many more. So we're all integrated and connected to each other and it allows for a more powerful event. When you do things like today, look at our panel, we're very diverse from multiple backgrounds, multiple areas and across the country. It's the same thing when they come together, it really fuels an even bigger output uh, and outreach. And I would say open communication and be open-minded, right? So we are obviously, um, you know, I come from a, we have Latina, Latinx clients, right? And they always joke like, why don't we hire another Latinx agency? Why are we hiring an Asian one? You know, and I'm like, and they're just like, no, but they're so good at what they do, right? I forgot who said that before, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the day you had to be awesome. I think it was Ari. Yes, it's all about your knowledge, your skill set, right? Not I don't expect someone to hire us for a project just because I'm a woman, right? Because they want to support women. I mean, that would be great. But first of all, I need to be an amazing agency. And then it's the fact that we're also diverse. That's kind of like the bonus, the cherry on top. But you know, so I, I think keep that in mind. You yourself can only add value. So make sure your skill set is there. You've done all the homework, all the research. You know, don't just say, oh, because I'm a woman, didn't, you didn't hire me because I'm a woman, right? Don't just always jump to conclusion that that's the case. And we're going to do our very last question quickly, uh, specifically for Ari. How do you get noticed in such a large, diverse company such as Disney with over 200,000 cast members without feeling like a number? Yeah, um, it took me a little while, and I'll share as well with Disney. Only about three years ago, diversity, inclusion, equity wasn't just a checkbox. Um, so the biggest thing is now they're allowing for more involvement and engagement from all levels, from senior executives all the way down to our frontline hour, hourly, including our college program participants. So what really happens is being able to volunteer, step up, get yourself involved in these organizations as a general member. That's how I started with Salute. And now I'm one of their co-chairs in just over a year showing my passion and interest. And now, especially with the bigger corporations, we talked a little about it before, is what are you doing beyond just the posting Black Lives Matter, right? Oh, it's Pride Month. Cool, we changed our logo to a rainbow. That's not enough anymore. So when you're going into these interviews, ask them, what did you do for COVID? What did you do during the Black Lives Matter? And a lot of that's coming out more and more. Uh, I think of like, for example, even Netflix, them going and banking now with banks of people of color, right? So taking that initiative and action. Uh, but back to the real question is, make sure you get involved with your organization groups there, whether there's an ERG, something of that nature, in the community or at that business employer, and then just keep raising your hand to volunteer and be partaking in things. And when you see that, those people in the further rooms will get noticed and they'll become your champion. Um, and that, I do wanna leave with one quick thing as well. Uh, we talked about at Disney is transparency. 
So you're going to see coming out hopefully next year, something that we are doing is being very transparent with our numbers, including hiring and making it public information, which you're going to see from a lot of companies coming out is where are we hiring women of color, males of colors, what people that are white, people that are not LGBTQ+, including those with disabilities. So we're creating a safe place so you can represent yourself and show, hey, look, I work for Disney and this is me being represented. Well, thank you all so much for our panel. We can stay on for a little bit uh, as well. We will uh, end the recording here. Uh, and thank you so much to Victor, Ari, Amanda, Lerma, and Jeff for your time, your insights, and your enthusiastic support for our students. I did drop your LinkedIn profiles in the chat, so I hope all of you will connect with our amazing panelists online. Uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Um, I'm afraid I have a four o'clock I have to run to right now, okay. but uh, anybody that um, had questions for me or uh, wanted to link up with me, uh, as Ann just mentioned, my LinkedIn profile, or you didn't see it, just hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, and look, panelists, it was great, great to meet you all. Um, and let's definitely uh, link up after this as well. Thank you, everybody. I have to run. <laughs>